Hello friends! In this video we will address the argument for tithing from Hebrews 7 verse 8. There are several different arguments to support and defend tithing and one of the most well-known and strongest arguments is connected to Hebrews 7 8. So in this video we will only be looking at this specific argument. The scripture reads, Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Anyone who is interested in the topic of tithing would really benefit by studying this argument as it has been historically one of the key fundamental evidences given in support of tithing, and the argument is actually quite simple. The Bible says that Jesus died on the cross, then rose from the dead, and afterward went to the heavenly sanctuary to be our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And since the priesthood of Melchizedek received tithes, and since Jesus is of the exact same priesthood, then he also should receive tithes. If Jesus has become the high priest of the exact same priesthood that receives tithes, then why should Christ not receive tithes? This is especially true because the notable characteristic of the priesthood of Melchizedek is that it is defined to be without end or perpetual. Quote, if Christ's priesthood was once a tithe-receiving priesthood, it is still a tithe-receiving priesthood, for it is an unchangeable one, seeing the priest ever liveth. Or quote, as tithes were paid to Melchizedek, a perpetual priest, only as the type of Christ, so it follows they are due to the great anti-type continually. Thus says the apostle, And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. That this priesthood, number one, receives tithes, and number two is a perpetual priesthood, has been one of the most common arguments presented in favor of tithing. And if you read the claims by people who oppose tithing, which I document on my channel, they almost never even try to answer this. Anti-tithers are notorious for trying to avoid this problem because they have no way to refute it. The book of Genesis covers thousands of years of human history in just 50 brief chapters. And so, it of course, does not record everything that happened over thousands of years, which makes it so remarkable that it does mention tithing. And the first recorded instance of Abraham tithing took place hundreds of years before Moses and hundreds of years before Sinai and is connected to the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is the very same priesthood that Christ now occupies. In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews chapter 7 demonstrates that the priesthood of Melchizedek was proven to be greater than the priesthood of the Levites by the fact that not only Abraham returned to tithe, but also, see verse 9, the Levites who were the descendants of Abraham. So, if Christ, as the high priest of this exact same order, does not receive tithes, then how? How is it proven that Christ is greater than the Levites? That is a critical question. The author of Hebrews 7 is very carefully and very deliberately presenting the evidence and structured argument that the priesthood of Melchizedek is superior to the Levitical because he received tithes from both Abraham and also the Levites. So, if Christ, as the high priest of this exact same order, does not receive tithes, then how? How is it proven that Christ is greater than the Levites? The argument is Melchizedek received tithes, therefore he is greater. So then how can it be said that Christ is also greater if he does not receive tithes? Again, anti-tithers are notorious for not answering this problem. The Holy Spirit of God makes this remarkable statement in Hebrews 7 verse 9, saying that symbolically even the Levites themselves paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. A Christian is someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ, and the Bible says that this same Jesus is our high priest. If it was necessary that our spiritual ancestors who lived under the Levitical order should return tithe, it is far more necessary that we should do so who live under the order of Melchizedek, since, as Hebrews 7.9 points out, that the Levitical priesthood itself paid tithes to Melchizedek. 
we Christians are under the priesthood of Melchizedek, and even the Levites themselves paid tithes to the very priesthood that we are now under. As Christians, we are called to remember and to preach that not only is Christ resurrected and alive, but he is actually occupying and performing a supremely important role as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, and it is precisely because of this that we can, quote, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Therefore, Christ performing the role of high priest is very real and very necessary. And if, as Hebrews 7 and the Old Testament describe the tithe as the means to acknowledge the priesthood, then how? How is someone supposed to acknowledge the priesthood of Christ unless one returns the tithe? You cannot separate the priesthood from Christ, and you cannot separate tithe from the priesthood. They are bound together. The returning of tithe has always been a person's outward evidence acknowledging the priesthood that they are under. So, if Christ is now the high priest, how is it possible to acknowledge him as high priest without returning the tithe? Not only does Hebrews 7 underscore the point that tithe is what demonstrates who has the greater priesthood, but it also proves that the nature of the tithe has not changed. The Bible says that the tithe was declared by God to be holy to the Lord. It is the Lord's. And since even the Levites are said to pay this holy tithe outside their priesthood to the order of Melchizedek, then the very nature, the holiness of tithe does not change with the changing of the priesthood, which means that the tithe is just as holy to the Lord today as it was then. And being holy, it must be returned to the Lord for the Lord's work of pointing people to the Messiah, to Jesus. And this is further proven by the fact that Jesus is God, who said in Numbers 18 that the returning of tithe was, quote, offered up as a heave offering to who? You can see for yourself right there, it was to the Lord. Although the people physically brought their tithes and physically returned those tithes to the Levites, in doing so, they were returning the tithe to God himself. The returning of tithe was defined as an act of worship of returning that which was holy to God himself. It was defined not only as a personal interaction between the people and the Levites, but as a personal interaction between the people and God. So the whole idea of Christ receiving tithes is not new or novel or unique because even here in Numbers 18, it states that he received tithes through his representatives, the Levites. And remember that Jesus is God. The Trinitarian nature of God is one of the most fundamental truths in Scripture. It was Christ himself who gave this system of tithing, and it was to Christ they returned the tithe. And it was Christ himself who received the tithe. So this concept of tithes being returned to the Lord is not something new or unusual, because even during the Levites, it literally and explicitly states, an offering to the Lord. Although the Levites, as God's representatives, physically received it, the returning of tithe was defined as a personal interaction between the worshiper and God. And since Hebrews 7 proves that the tithe is holy regardless of priesthood, and since Jesus is our high priest, then returning the tithe is just as much an obligation today as it was then, and it is just as much a personal interaction with Jesus today as it was then. When the Levites received the tenth from the Israelites, the people of God were giving outward evidence and testimony that their allegiance and loyalty were to the one true God. They were publicly demonstrating that they were under the priesthood that pointed people to the Messiah, to the Christ. And since even this priesthood returned a tithe outside to the very order that Christ himself now occupies, the returning of tithe is a testimony. It is a public testimony and demonstration of our allegiance and loyalty to Jesus, our high priest. However, for those people who refuse, this creates a serious problem because 
If God has declared that the tithe is holy by nature and his personal property, then not returning the tithe is theft, and the Bible explicitly states that thieves will not, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Furthermore, if tithe is a testimony of the priesthood that we are under, and if people do not return tithe, then this demonstrates that we will not recognize the priesthood of Christ. Now, take a moment to stop and think about that. In popular Christianity today, many will open their mouths and profess that Jesus is their Lord. With their mouths, they will say that Jesus is their high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who blessed Abraham, who gives blessings. Yet their wallet testifies the complete opposite. In other words, people say that Jesus is their high priest, but they take the sacred holy portion for themselves and refuse to return the very thing that serves as outward evidence that they are loyal to the priesthood of Christ. In the year 1843, an author made this very observation, quote, All men are desirous enough for his blessing, but very averse to give him tithe in return. None will deny Christ to be a priest who perpetually blesses, but few like to hear of his perpetual taking of tithe. People will literally steal from Jesus, the high priest, and then simultaneously expect his blessing. Now, this is quite remarkable considering that Christians in general don't do this anywhere else in society. Christians don't go around stealing from stores, restaurants, and businesses and then turn around and expect good service because everybody knows that when you victimize people and wrongfully take what is theirs, then they won't want to bless you. But this is exactly what many do to Jesus and they don't do it just once. Oh no, they do it over and over and over again, all the while expecting a blessing. Furthermore, not only does the Bible describe Melchizedek as a representative or type pointing forward to Christ, but also Abraham as the father of the faithful points forward as a representative of the church which is precisely the point made right here in Romans chapter 4, that Abraham is the who? He is the father of all those who believe. And to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the who? The father of us all. Abraham, who was a representative of the body of believers, the church, he returned tithe to Melchizedek, the representative of Christ. And if Christ is the antitype or fulfillment of Melchizedek, and since the church is the antitype or fulfillment of Abraham, then tithing is as natural to one as it was to the other because tithing demonstrates the superiority of the priesthood. We know that this is of faith and of the gospel because the Bible explicitly says that Abraham is the father of all those who believe, that the gospel was preached to Abraham, and only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. The beauty of this argument is that it is all about faith, all about the gospel, and all about Jesus, about Christ. The beauty of this argument is that it harmonizes and dovetails perfectly with other scriptures, such as 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul argues for the support of the gospel ministry, and right here in verse 13, appeals to the model of tithing and offerings, and says in verse 14, even so, or in some versions, in the same way, this is commanded by the Lord for the support of the gospel. As the children of Abraham before us gave a 10% minimum to point to the Messiah, so also, in the same way, we children of Abraham are also to return a 10% minimum. And Paul says this is a command of the Lord and explicitly says this is for the gospel. This is all about Jesus, all about the cross, all about the gospel being preached so that people can hear the good news about Christ and be saved. Sometimes people will say that Jesus doesn't need our money, but that is not true because his bride does. The Bible teaches that his bride is the church and the work of the church requires support to preach the gospel. When people refuse to return the tenth, not only do they error by taking what rightfully belongs to Jesus, but they prevent others from hearing the gospel, and in doing so, they rob Jesus 
of souls that might have been redeemed. When we consider the sad statistics of how many professed Christians refuse to return the tithe, it is easy to wonder how many multiplied millions and millions of souls around the world have died without hearing the gospel of salvation, but who could have and who should have heard the gospel if Christians had returned the Lord's tenth set aside for that express purpose. And now, having summarized the evidence, let's now address the objections. Overall, most people who oppose tithing, they just try to stay away from Hebrews chapter 7. It causes too many problems for them, so they usually try to just ignore it. But if they have to, one of the most common responses is to say, well, Hebrews chapter 7, is that's not teaching tithing. It is teaching the superiority of the priesthood. But this response is absurd because in order to prove the superiority of the priesthood, it is the tithe that is given as the proof which only ignores the argument. If Melchizedek receiving tithe is proof of the superior priesthood and if Christ as the high priest of this exact same order does not receive tithes, then how? How is it proven that Christ is greater than the Levites? People who give this response ignore the argument. They want to state the conclusion that Jesus is superior, but they don't want to address the argument because doing so would undermine their claims. If Jesus does not receive tithe, then by this very argument, he is neither superior to Melchizedek nor the Levites. He would be therefore inferior. Another common response is to point to verse 8 and say, well, this verse 8 is only pointing to Melchizedek, the man and the Levites. That verse 8 is not and cannot be referring to Jesus because, as they claim, the word here in the phrase, and here, men that die receive tithes, is a reference to the Levitical priests existing at the time that the book of Hebrews was written and that the second part of the verse, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives, is a reference to Melchizedek, the man who lived during the time of Abraham. There are, however, two problems with this. Problem number one is that this is a logical fallacy called false dilemmas. It is not a matter of either or, but both and. When the scripture says that it is witnessed that he lives, this is true of both Melchizedek and Jesus. It's not either or, but both and. It is true in a literary sense that Melchizedek still lives, for there is no record of his death. But, is, but it is absolutely true for Jesus in a literal sense. For Melchizedek, it is literary, but for Jesus, it is literal. However, even even if for the sake of discussion we say that this is only referring to Melchizedek, that brings us to problem number two. It is important to make the observation that the argument for tithing is a conceptual argument. It is based on the concept or argument found in Hebrews 7. The writer of Hebrews is presenting very developed, very thoughtful arguments for a mature, intelligent audience, and he presents a biblical argument based on multiple pieces of evidence, and with this evidence, we can establish several premises. Premises number one, priesthood of Melchizedek is perpetual. Premise number two, the priesthood of Melchizedek received tithes. Premise number three, Jesus is of the same order. Conclusion, since this unending priesthood receives tithes, and since Jesus is of the same order, then Jesus also must receive tithes. In order to defeat the argument, you must defeat the premises, which cannot be done, and this is exactly why people who oppose tithing try so hard to ignore this. And to highlight this point, even if you take a pair of scissors and cut verse 8 out of the Bible, the argument still remains. It's still there. If you take an eraser and er erase verse 8, the argument doesn't go away. It's still there. Another response, although not a very common one, is to try to confuse the issue by bringing up the belief or speculation that Jesus and Melchizedek are one and the same person that Melchizedek was a Christophany, but this is false for a variety of reasons. The simplest one is to observe that 
Jesus was never an earthly civil magistrate. The Bible says that Melchizedek ruled over Salem as the king, but Jesus never occupied the office of a ruler over some earthly city-state. Melchizedek did. While the book of Hebrews and Psalm 110 uses Melchizedek as a type pointing forward to Jesus, he himself was not Jesus. He was his own individual person. Furthermore, you will notice that in verse 15, it says that Jesus is, quote, another priest in the likeness of Melchizedek. Now, if Melchizedek the priest was already Jesus, then why would there be another priest? The key word is right here, another. There would be another priest, but this makes no sense if Melchizedek was already Jesus. For example, if Melchizedek is already Jesus, but there will arise another priest like Jesus, but this other priest is actually Jesus, then how can Jesus be another Jesus? Now, now you would have two Jesuses, but that is absurd. No, Melchizedek was his own individual person. Another common response is to try to import false presuppositions into Hebrews 7 from Genesis 14. For example, People will respond and say, well, yes, it's true that Melchizedek received tithes, and it is true that Jesus is a priest of the same order, and there's certainly nothing wrong with returning 10% to Jesus, but since Abraham was never commanded, then therefore, here in Hebrews 7, it's not really an obligation for Christians to return tithes to Jesus. Now, as I have pointed out before in previous videos, Every single argument about tithe eventually goes back to Abraham. The tithe of Abraham is the key biblical historical narrative for the topic of tithing because the claims that are made about Abraham will later be used for the other arguments in the Bible. Now, in this case, for Hebrews 7, 8, people will say that Abraham only gave voluntarily and not by command. So therefore, in Hebrews 7, any giving of a Christian is never by command or obligation, but is purely voluntary out of the goodness of your heart. However, this response is again refuted by the text itself, which, which explicitly states here in verse 5, that the Levites received tithe by commandment. And then immediately in verse 6, But he whose genealogy is not derived from Levi received tithes from Abraham. Hebrews chapter 7 is primarily concerned with proving that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and that this priesthood is greater than the Levites. And so the author makes his case using this story of Abraham's tithe, and in doing so, one evidence he says, consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils, and that he blessed him who had the promises. Beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Very important point. If this was nothing more than a voluntary free will offering, if this was nothing more than Abraham's gift of gratitude, then this would not do anything to prove that Melchizedek was greater. In fact, it would prove the opposite. It would prove Abraham's greatness because he is the one being generous with a gift. However, if in fact Melchizedek is greater, then this is a form of tribute. This is a tithe that is due. It is owed to Melchizedek by virtue of his position and rank of priest of the Most High God. And unless Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek as a matter of tribute, as a matter of duty, then the argument in Hebrews would contradict itself because, again, how? How could Levi, whose tithes were of obligation and commandment, pay tithe through Abraham if it was not also by commandment? People who oppose tithing try so hard to create a false dichotomy between the tithe of Abraham and the tithe of the Levites by claiming that one was holy and one was not, that one was by command and the other was not, that these tithes are as different as apples and oranges. 
but this is refuted by the text itself, which plainly states that symbolically, even the Levites themselves paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. If the tithes were as different as apples and oranges, then the symbolism would be false and the argument would fall apart. But it's not false because these scriptures are the infallible inspired words of God, which proves that the tithe of the Levites was of the exact same nature as the tithe to Melchizedek. It was just as holy to God and it was owed to Melchizedek by virtue of his priesthood, just as it was owed to the Levites by virtue of their priesthood. And since even the Levites paid tithe to Melchizedek, and since we Christians are under the exact same priesthood, then we also should gladly return the tithe to our wonderful great high priest Jesus for the furtherance of the good news of the gospel. It is all about Jesus. It's all about our Savior and our high priest, all about the good news of the gospel. There is, of course, more that can be said, but that is enough for today. I have covered all the main points and common responses. If you want to learn more, please check out my other videos. And as always, have a nice day.